Thank, thanks for having me, although the, the pressure's up now that you've said this about my talk from the past years. So thank you all for having me come talk to you today about uh, genetic factors associated with HIV susceptibility and resistance. And like Esper said, it's going to be more of a review talk. At the end of this, this talk, there's going to be a little section on some research that I'm interested in. But again, this is going to focus uh, on a lot of literature and on uh, uh, mainly review. So as many of you know, people vary in their susceptibility in the uh, uh, very substantially in their level of susceptibility to HIV. This can occur at a couple of different stages. First, at the, at the exposure to HIV, some people become infected and others don't, and there are associations with, with that. And in those who become infected with HIV, some progress more rapidly to, to disease and others progress more slowly. And there are many factors that can influence this disease susceptibility, including host genetics, viral sequence and environmental factors. It appears as the, though about 15 to 20 percent of the influence can come from host genetics. So today I'm going to focus this talk on four major areas. First, I'm going to share with you polymorphisms that prevent viral entry and I will focus on CCR5. Then I'll talk about polymorphisms in the human leukocyte antigen or the HLA. Then we'll talk a little bit about polymorphisms in the killer cell immunoglobulin-like receptors, which is a mouthful to say. But we'll talk about those as well. And then last, I'll focus on some genomic approaches. So we'll just start with CCR5. As many of you know, CCR5 is a co-receptor for uh, HIV viral entry. On the left, you can see a CD4 T cell, which has a CD4 molecule and a CCR5 co-receptor. And here's a picture of the viral envelope protein. And it has to interact with both CD4 and CCR5 in order to detect a CD4 T cell and then in infect it. We know of many polymorphisms in CCR5. Polymorphisms, which I'm going to use that word a lot during this talk, are simply variations within the nucleotide sequence. There are a number of these polymorphisms throughout the CCR5 gene, shown here in different colors and with different circles. Some affect amino acid sequences, some don't affect amino acid sequences. But the one that I want to highlight is this delta 32 mutation in the middle of the gene. And this delta 32 mutation produces a non-functional CCR5 gene, or a non-functional CCR5 protein. The frequency of this mutation in the population is about 10%. And the frequency of those who are homozygous for this mutation is about 1%. So it's a reasonable frequency. This is um, some data that I obtained from Mary Carrington of an older study where they looked at the frequency of, the, of being homozygous for the wild type CCR5 gene, heterozygous for the delta 32 mutation, and homozygous for the delta 32 mutation among people who were infected with HIV and those who were not infected. You can see that the frequency of people who had the, um, the CCR5, who were homozygous for the CCR5 wild type gene was pretty even between the, the, the HIV negative group and the HIV positive group. In addition, the frequency of those who were heterozygous for the CCR5 delta 32 mutation was pretty similar between the two groups as well. But when they looked at those who are homozygous for the delta 32 mutation, they found about 15-fold um, greater frequency in people who were not infected with HIV than those who were infected with HIV. One may ask, is there any relationship with CCR5 delta 32 heterozygosity in disease course? It doesn't seem to affect disease susceptibility, but it do does it affect disease course? And you'll see many of these graphs throughout my talk today. But on the y-axis, you see the fraction of those who are AIDS-free and the time since seroconversion. And in gray, you see the uh, disease cores for those who, who are homozygous for the wild-type CCR5 gene. And those who are heterozygous for the delta 32 mutation is shown in blue. So those who are heterozygous for the delta 32 mutation progress to disease more slowly than those who have wild-type CCR5 gene. 
And this is evidence that this is a dominant trait in these people. So given this important role of, or what we found to be an important role of the Delta 32 mutation in either preventing infection or slowing down disease course, a number of different groups have tried to look at therapies that are aimed at blocking CCR5. Now many of you, I'm sure, have heard of the Berlin patient. It's been a famous, famous story for the last couple of years, and this is a really um, unique case where a group in Germany asked if HIV could be eliminated simply by transplanting in, simply is maybe a bad word to use, but by transplanting in the Delta 32 homozygous lymphocytes into this patient. So he was a patient who was HIV positive, who had acute myeloid leukemia. He had been HIV positive for more than 10 years. He was a Delta 32 heterozygote. And after his AML relapse, he received an allogeneic stem cell transplant from a patient who was homozygous for the CCR5 Delta 32 mutation. This transplant led to remission of AML and undetectable HIV status. So many people have thought that this man is cured of, of HIV. And I think that Matthias is going to be talking a little bit later about uh, HIV cure, so maybe he'll, he'll talk a little more about this. But what I want to share with you is a, um, a, a, one of the figures from their paper describing this individual's viral load and his CD4 counts after these different stem cell transplants. On the top, you can see his, his HIV viral loads, and on the bottom are his CD4 T cell counts. Here you can see a timeline of his disease course and when he received his stem cell transplant. This is when he, he received um, antiretroviral treatment. So he got his AML diagnosis, he was on, put on antiretrovirals, his viral loads came down, and then he received his first stem cell transplant from the donor who was a Delta 32 homozygote. You can see his viral loads remained low and his CD4 counts went up. And then he received a second stem cell transplant several months later. His viral load still remained low and his CD4 counts went up even further. And just last year when this story was really discussed heavily in the news, they had an update on his CD4 counts three and a half years after, after this transplant, after his, last, uh, after his initial transplantation. And you can see that his CD4 counts were quite high, and I think that this, um, this solid bar up here represents what would be seen in a normal, healthy individual. So it appears as though this transplant has, has led to a complete remission of his um, HIV, which was quite amazing. In addition, his HIV RNA and DNA remained undetectable. And one can look at this um, a little bit more diagnostically through um, PCR, where you can evaluate whether the cells in an individual has uh, CCR5 wild type or CCR5 delta 32 simply with a diagnostic PCR test. And on the far right, you can see in an individual who is heterozygous for the delta 32 mutation, they would have a, lar uh, um, a larger band indicative of the wild type CCR5 gene, and then a smaller band indicative of the delta 32 mutation. An individual who's homozygous for the wild type gene would only have this upper band, which means this lower band corresponds to the Delta 32 mutation. And in this specific patient at 24 and 29 months after his transplant, you can see that all of the cells that they examined had the Delta 32 mutation, suggesting that all his cells were entirely replaced by CCR5 Delta 32 homozygous cells. And if you haven't seen this picture, this is this is the Berlin patient, Timothy Brown, looking very happy with his dog and seems to be doing well as far as, as, far as we know. So given, given this success story, um, an expensive success story, but a success story no less, a number of people have tried to ask, is there an alternate idea that we can use to potentially cure HIV? And one approach to this is is to try to delete CCR5 and T cells in the absence of a bone marrow transplant. And the approach that um, a couple of companies have been using is to use what are called zinc finger nucleases to disrupt the CCR5 gene in autologous T cells. And I'm going to walk you through this a little bit in the next few slides. So I took this slide from a poster at Croy just, just last month describing how zinc finger nucleases work. These are comprised of two domains, uh, a nuclease domain with a restriction enzymes 
this um, um, BAC1 protein, and then zinc finger proteins that can bind the DNA. So a specific endogenous gene could be targeted for disruption, such that the zinc finger nucleases would dimerize and bind to the DNA, introduce a double-stranded break, break the DNA, resulting in a loss of genetic information, and this gene is disrupted. One could imagine this working in practice on this following image that, again, I took from this, this Croy poster. A patient could be subjected to leukapheresis, so all of their immune cells could be collected, and the monocytes and CD8 T cells would be depleted. They would be enriched for their, or their sample would be enriched for CD4 T cells. Then they would be transduced with this product containing the zinc finger nuclease, and it would delete the CCR5 gene from these patients, expand these cells, and then infuse them back into the patient and see whether or not it would help control HIV and increase the CD4 counts. There have been recently some clinical trials of the zinc finger nucleases. It's this SB728 compound. It's developed by a company called Sangamo Biosciences, and they have been conducting phase one, two trials designed to evaluate safety, but not necessarily to evaluate efficacy. And some of these early results from their phase one studies were reported just last month. They had examined six immunological responders and nine non-responders in their study, and they were treated with this SB728 product using the sort of model that I showed you a minute ago. And it, they found there were dramatic increases in their CD4 counts and in the, 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 um, the, um, the cells that they had treated by day seven. So it, it suggested that this approach may have worked. It may have actually promoted a rebound of these individual CD4 T cells. Their viral load had decreased as well, and there were only a few uh, adverse events. So although this is very early data, it's a phase one trial, it, it sort of demonstrates that it's possible to maybe try to knock out CCR5 using this sort of genetic modification as a way to improve outcome for some patients. It's still probably going to be expensive. So is there yet another approach we could take to, to eliminate the, the CCR5 molecule? And yes, there is, and I'm sure many of you have heard of CCR5 inhibitor drugs that could be used. The, the one is called Maravroc. It was approved in 2007. Um, and um, what you can imagine here is simply that this is a small molecule that's gonna block the interaction of envelope with, with CCR5. Much uh, relatively simpler approach compared to the last two that I just mentioned. The biggest problem with this approach is that it's not gonna block CXCR4 tropic viruses. And so in patients who are treated with these drugs, the most common form of resistance that's seen is the outgrowth of CXCR4 viruses. Nonetheless, there's been apparent benefits for using this drug as a third-line therapy and so on. It's unclear whether it will actually be beneficial in treatment-naive patients. Um, but so typing for CXCR4 versus CCR5 patients is important, and trying to improve diagnostics to type people to make sure that they have CCR5 tropic viruses, not CXCR4 tropic viruses, is important when determining whether to put a patient on this type of drug. Although still, it's probably the cheaper of the, the three approaches, but we want to do um, what will work. So that's what I wanted to talk to you about with respect to CCR5 polymorphisms. And now what I'd like to do is move on to polymorphisms in the human light leukocyte antigen that are associated with control and susceptibility. So many of you know, the human leukocyte antigen, also referred to as the major histocompatibility complex, can also be called the HLA. It is located on antigen-presenting cells, and it presents peptides to the T cell receptor of a, of a T cell. I'm sure many of you have learned that in your basic immunology classes. The genomic organization of the HLA is located on chromosome 6. This always gives me an opportunity to put a picture of my son in my talks. It's my favorite thing to do. Um, so, so each person has uh, two copies of the HLA A, B, and C genes. You inherit one copy from your mom and one copy from your dad. If you haven't seen him running around yet, I'm sure you will in the next couple days. <laughs> 
Um, but these genes are located on chromosome six. So and each person then has a total of six HLA alleles. In addition to having a number of different HLA genes in an individual, those genes are highly polymorphic. As of just earlier this month, um, the IMGT HLA database, database had reported there were 1,757 class 1A alleles, 2,338 class 1B alleles, and 1,304 class 1C alleles. So that means it's very difficult to find multiple people who have identical HLA genes. Heterozygosity at the HLA increases the number of alleles you have. So on the left, you can see a person who would be homozygous throughout the HLA. They would have the same A gene, C gene, and B gene. And a heterozygous individual would have different A, B, and C genes, and so on. So a homozygous individual could have three different HLA genes and could present three different sets of peptides to T cells, whereas a heterozygous individual would have six different genes and present six different sets of peptides to T cells. So simply by being heterozygous throughout the HLA broadens the possibility of, of immune responses that one could, could, or that could be elicited in an individual. And in 1999, it was uh, described, a, there was described a heterozygous advantage in, in people who had HIV. So on the, again, on the left, you can see the fraction who are AIDS free, and on the uh, x-axis, you can see the time since zero conversion. People who are homozygous at the HLA at two or three loci progress to disease much more rapidly than those who are heterozygous at all these loci. And we actually reported um, in 2010 a very similar observation in the macaque model. We're still trying to understand if this heterozygosity, this heterozygous effect can be attributed to mounting a broader set of CD8 T cell responses or simply being more likely to get the right T cell response. And that mechanism is still unclear. But it's still a very provocative observation that heterozygosity prolongs disease course and homozygosity tends to accelerate disease course. There are specific HLA genes that are known to associate with outcome. HLA B57 is um, the, the strongest one that we've observed and it's been overrepresented in long-term non-progressors. This allele has been linked to prolonged decline of CD4 T cells and a lower viral load set point. The mechanism for this effect is it seems to be that CD8 T cell responses elicited by this HLA gene select for escape variants with reduced viral fitness. And the, this HLA molecule also restricts a number of different gag epitopes which are particularly immunogenic. Now, HLA-B27 has seen similar effects. This gene is also represented or overrepresented in long-term non-progressors. It's been linked to a prolonged onset of AIDS and a lower viral load set point. Similar mechanism to B57, but there are some distinctions. Now, there are some other HLA alleles that have been associated with a lower viral load set point. This is a, an, a figure from a paper in 2004, and you can see that HLA-B57 is at the top. This is a, a graph of the log viral load set point in these individuals, and the red line indicates a sort of an average viral load set point. And those who are B57 are clearly to the left of this line, indicating a lower viral load set point. And a number of different alleles were explored in this study, and there are many others that tend to associate with outcome but haven't been studied nearly as well as B57 and B27. So you may ask, by looking at this, graph, what about the, the alleles at the bottom of this slide? What about alleles that associate with a higher viral load set point? And in fact, there's a group of HLA alleles, HLA-B35-PX alleles, that are linked to faster disease progression. Using a, a graph similar to the ones I've shown you before today, though this black line represents patients who did not have HLA-B35, the blue line represents patients who had a different category of B35 genes, B35PY, and then the red line indicates those patients who had HLA-B35PX, and you can see that this line drops more quickly 
indicating that these patients progressed more rapidly to disease. So what about other HLA genes or other regions of the HLA that may associate with outcome? Well, there's another um, polymorphism that's upstream of the HLA-C locus that associates with outcome. HLA-C molecules um, are expressed lower on the cell surface than HLA-A or B molecules, and they're not downregulated by HIV-NEF. But there's a SNP that's located upstream of HLA-C that was reported just a couple of years ago, and it's found that people who are homozygous for the CC nucleotide have higher HLA-C expression, and those who are homozygous for the TT nucleotide have a lower HLA-C expression. So what does this actually mean for a person's disease course? Well, you can look at, or they looked at the viral load set point in patients who are homozygous for the TT allele, or the CC alleles, or they were heterozygous for the CT alleles. And remember, the CC allele, in the, or being homozygous for the CC alleles, is associated with higher HLAC expression. And these patients had a lower viral load set point than those who were homozygous for the TT allele, suggesting that a higher HLAC expression was associated with a better outcome. And just last year, it was reported that this expression is actually controlled by microRNAs. So I don't want to get into the details of how that works, but it's sort of a fascinating story if you want to go explore it. So that's what I was going to talk to you about, some specific HLA polymorphisms that associate with outcome. And now I'd like to move on to describe some killer cell immunoglobulin-like receptor, or KIR, polymorphisms. So if you haven't heard of KIRs, these are present on the surface of natural killer cells. There are both inhibitory KIRs and there are activating KIRs. They're located on chromosome 19 in the leukocyte receptor complex, so they're located on a different chromosome than the HLA genes. Remember, the HLA genes were on chromosome 6, KIR genes are on chromosome 19. But the HLA can act as a KIR ligand, so HLA molecules can act as KIR ligands. If you look at a diagram of chromosome 19, shown here, then you can expand the leukocyte receptor complex, and then you can expand this KIR region. You can see that the the, the, uh, the KIR region of the genome is actually quite complex, just like the HLA region of the genome. You can see there are multiple KIR genes. And this is actually even more complex than that model can show. There are variable numbers of genes on different KIR haplotypes. There can be 8 to 14 genes or pseudogenes per KIR haplotype. These different KIR genes are also quite polymorphic, just like the HLA. There are 614 described human KIR alleles, and these KIRs can be variable, variably expressed, so a single NK cell can stochastically turn on or turn off one of these different KIR genes. Now, this is my very simplistic model of how an activating KIR will work, and I'm only showing you this because I, I want to share with you some data um, implicating the KIR 3DS1 molecule and, and control of, of HIV. So for an activating KIR, it would be present on an NK cell, and here's a CD4 T cell with an MHC molecule. If they don't interact, there's no, nothing's going to happen. The NK cell is going to leave the, the CD4 target alone. But in my very simplistic model, the KIR molecule will bind to the, the HLA molecule on a CD4 T cell, and this interaction will promote killing. In this 2002 study, they investigated whether there were genetic associations with, between cures and disease course. And they found that there was. So let me walk you through the different um, lines on this, on this graph. They first found that patients in gray who didn't have the cure 3DS molecule that I mentioned and a certain group of HLA genes, those that are called BW4 80 isoleucine. It's just a special category of HLA genes that have certain characteristics. Patients who didn't have either of these genes progressed to disease at, at a particular rate. And patients who only had the CURE3DS1 gene, 
shown in orange, they followed a very similar path. In patients who only had that group of HLA genes, that BW480I group, they progressed to disease at a very similar, uh, at a very similar course. However, in patients who had both the CURE3DS1 and that HLA BW480I seleucine gene, they seem to progress to disease more slowly. And since this paper was published, many groups have been trying to identify this mechanism for, for control. There's some functional data that supports the protective role of CURE3DS1. And in this study, they looked at NK cells derived from subjects expressing either um, both the CURE gene and the HLA genes, or only the HLA gene, or only the CURE genes. And they looked to see which NK cells could suppress spiral replication in vitro. And they found that only in patients who had both the CURE gene and that group of HLA genes, they were able to inhibit viral replication the best, suggesting that you need to have, again, both these components and it will suppress viral replication. And just last year, a study looked at copy number variation of CURE3DS1 and how that can associate with viral load set point. They looked at what they called effective copy number, where they had to take into account that a patient would have both the CURE3DS1 gene and that specific group of HLA genes. Otherwise, there was, there was no observable effect. And you can see that as the effective copy number increased with an, uh, three as their effective copy number, the mean viral load set point decreased, suggesting that more, um, more of these cure genes leads to a better outcome. So just to summarize this dis description of cure genes and how it can impact disease course, there have been genetic associations between cures and disease course, although the mechanisms are still a bit unclear and those are still being unraveled. It's unclear whether the cure and HLA effects that I've shared with you are synergistic or independent. And, but it's very difficult to perform these studies because you have to find enough patients with the right cure genes and the right HLA genes to perform all the appropriate analyses. So the few pieces of information that I've shared with you today um, are really difficult to come by because um, it's difficult to find the patients with the necessary characteristics. Nevertheless, the bottom line is these studies provide clues that cures can play an important role in HIV. And just to provide you with a summary from um, uh, an, il an illustration from a review in 2009, this review described how the HLA can affect many different ways that the immune response responds to HIV infection. The HLA can interact with dendritic cells, which I didn't talk about today, but we'll, we'll put that, we'll, we'll accept that for now. Um, how the HLA genes can interact with cure molecules in a way to elicit NK immune responses. And how the HLA can also interact with T cell receptors on CD8 T cells to elicit effective immune responses. So lastly, I'm going to focus on some genomic approaches that have been used recently to examine other host genes that may be associated with HIV disease course. From 2007 until October 2010, a number of different genomic approaches have been used to examine uh, which genes might be important in, in controlling HIV. There have been genome-wide association studies, evolutionary analyses, transcriptome studies, gain-of-function screens, proteome studies, and so on. So you can see that these sort of genomic approaches have spanned from looking at the DNA all the way to looking at uh, the proteins that are present in an individual. There are a number of different phenotypes that have been studied in, in these experiments as well. Some people have used HIV resistance or acquisition, so whether or not people become infected with HIV or not uh, as their um, marker to categorize individuals. People have used HIV viral load as a way to set up their, their categories where they're looking at viral load set points. 
those who have low viral set points versus high set points, intracellular HIV DNA, elite controller status. Some, some of these studies have evaluated HIV disease progression, where they use CD4 T cell decreases, time to AIDS, rapid progression, non-progression as their, as their way to classify patients. But the ultimate goal, no matter which way you categorize patients, is to really identify important genes that are linked to control of HIV. I'm not going to go through all the different types of studies. What I want to do is focus on a couple of genome-wide association studies today. The first one was actually the initial genome-wide association study in 2007, where they evaluated uh, less than 500 patients to look at whole genome associations uh, of control of HIV. And in this study, they found back in 2007 two SNPs that could account for 15% of the variation in set point, HLA-B5701 and a SNP upstream of HLA-C. I don't know about you, but we talked about these today. So um, they found what, we, what we've already talked about today and, and uh, what had been found by candidate gene studies pre prior to, to these experiments. So in 2010, a report by the HIV controller study uh, was published in Science. And this was a study where they had a multinational consortium of HIV-positive individuals, and they said, we're going to look at a lot of patients who are controllers and see if we can find some genetic associations. Maybe if we look at more and we look at those who are super elite controllers, we can identify more genetic associations than just simply those that are in the HLA region. And they found 1,528 controllers. These are people whose virus loads were less than 2,000 copies per mil. And in fact, at the University of Wisconsin, we were able to participate and identify a couple of patients to add to their study. They had an advanced disease group as well, and they examined three different ethnic groups, European, African American, and Hispanics. And so they had thousands of patients that they enrolled in this study, and they did genome-wide association experiments. And then you can see the results on this Manhattan plot. And in this sort of diagram, on the y-axis indicates essentially significance with association, and on the x-axis is the chromosome. And all of the points that appear to significantly associate with an outcome are those in chromosome 6. And if you remember, chromosome 6 contains the MHC, or the HLA. And they identified 313 genome-wide significant SNPs that were all within the, the MHC, or the HLA region. When they then dove into these SNPs to figure out what they actually were, were, where they were actually located and what they were responsible for. They found four independent SNPs that explained 19% of the control. One of these was one that was in 35 kilobases upstream of HLA-C, associated with expression levels, again, the, the, the one that I described to you earlier. They also found another SNP that was proxy for HLA-B5701 and a couple of other SNPs in the HLA as well. So now if you include CCR5 polymorphisms, 23% of HIV control can be explained by these SNPs in the HLA and those in CCR5. So that's now what we're left with. Are there possibly other host genetic associations that could be made? Well, of course. Um, in many of these genomic studies, only factors with a big influence will be seen, but rarer variants may not be seen. And these could also differ from platform to platform. And just in the last year, there have been a couple of other genes that have been described, uh, simply as showing associations. Um, shown here, PARD 3B and RICH2. And I think that I saw in Journal of Infectious Diseases next month, they were gonna, there was going to be a paper about an, another, another host gene. So, so I think that these genome-wide associations have really told us that the HLA and the MHC plays a large role in, in control of HIV, and so we still need to keep looking for other factors that may play an important role. Now, my lab is quite new, as Esper mentioned. I started my lab in last September, and so my lab has an interest in understanding host genetics and control of HIV, but we are, my lab's also interested in trying to understand if host genetics can influence the course of other infectious diseases. Of course, you would, you would think that it could. And we've learned a lot about the control, the, the role of host genetics in control of HIV from humans, and we've been able to recapitulate that in monkeys. 
There are, are known um, HL or MHC genes in monkeys that associate with control of SIV infection, and we also know that uh, MH MHC heterozygosity associates with control of SIV uh, as, as well. So my lab is interested in trying to see whether certain genetic associations with other infectious diseases that have been found in humans can also be found in monkeys. And so my lab's interested actually in exploring tuberculosis, so I'm sorry this is not specifically HIV, but related topic, hope it's close enough. As many of you probably know, a third of the world's population is infected with TB, or with Mycobacterium tuberculosis. 95% of, of infected individuals have latent TB disease, and the likelihood for reactivation of latent TB in an HIV-naive individual is about 10% in a lifetime. But if one's co-infected with HIV, that can increase to about 10% per year, making it the leading cause of death among HIV-positive individuals. So there's definitely a need to understand the effective host immune response to TB. So I, I, my lab's trying to sort of explore the literature and try to find out, are there certain host genes that are associated with control of tuberculosis? And just like with HIV, there have been a number of different candidate gene studies that have been performed to look for gene, host genes that are associated with control of tuberculosis. And they found that some of the HLA genes associate with control, primarily class two genes. Other genes, such as NRAMP1, which is a divalent transporter regulating cytoplasmic cation levels, interferon gamma, as many of you know, a cytokine, NAS2A, CCL2, toll-like receptors. This list can go on and on and on. But there are a lot of caveats to these studies. Sometimes they're first identified in animals, like in mice, but they can't necessarily be recapitulated in human studies. These associations are not made in every population, because these SNPs vary from population to population. Sometimes there's genetic data to link uh, a particular SNP with outcome, but there's no functional data to explain why that works. And some of these gene-gene interactions can complicate these uh, analyses. So just like with HIV, the TB field turned to using genome-wide association studies to look for control of, of tuberculosis. But unfortunately, these have actually been quite limited compared to the extensive list of genomic approaches that have been used to study HIV. There's been an African cohort that's been studied, and they found a susceptibility locus in the gene on chromosome 18 and a resistance locus on chromosome 11, but neither of these genes were present in that previous list of candidate genes that I shared with you before. There's been a cohort in Southeast Asia and Russia where they identified nine SNPs, and a couple of these SNPs were located in that candidate gene list that I shared with you before. But this study was not particularly strong. So the detection of variants by the genome-wide association studies to look for host gen genes that are associated with TB is, is quite difficult. There are many host genetic effects that could have small individual functions and then combined they have large functions. So there may not be a single gene that we can find in the host genome that associates with control of TB in con contrast to what we found so far with the genome-wide association studies for HIV control. So my lab is interested in trying to look at the, the role of host genetics of con control of TB in monkeys. I don't know how much you, you are familiar with um, Cinemologus macaques. It's a, I don't know if Dave talked about Cinemologus macaques earlier, but it's a, a species of, of, of monkeys, and they're susceptible to Mycobacterium tuberculosis. About 50% of these animals develop latent TB, and about 50% develop active TB. So this ratio is not quite the same as in humans. Many more animals develop active TB when compared to, um, when compared to, to humans. And as a, a little other piece, piece of information, of those who develop latent TB, they can be co-infected with SIV and there's, they can reactivate their TB just like humans reactivate TB after co-infection with HIV. The pathology of TB disease in these monkeys mirrors what's observed in humans. And one thing that my group is interested in is testing the hypothesis that there are host genetic polymorphisms in cinemologous macaques 
that can explain why so many of, the, of these animals get active TB. So can we find host genes in these synomologous macaques that can explain why 50% of these animals get active TB when compared to humans, where only 5% of humans tend to get active TB. The ultimate goal of my study is then to identify um, these genes that associate with active TB and those that associate with, with control of TB, hoping to improve the monkey model for testing clinical interventions uh, for TB. And to pursue this study, we're working closely with a group at the University of Pittsburgh who, who have in, who's infected 200 monkeys with TB. About 100 of them develop active TB and 100 develop latent TB. And we're in the process of working um, with the, this group, it's Joanne Flynn group, Flynn's group at the University of Pittsburgh, to genotype these animals for their MHC because some of the HLA genes were shown to associate with control of TB in humans. And again, some of these other genes like NRAMP1 and interferon gamma, some of the same ones that, that have been detected in humans to see if these SNPs appear in the monkey population so we can further explore the immune control mechanisms in these monkeys. So hopefully after what I've shared with you today, now you have a better understanding of certain points where host genetics can affect disease progression in HIV, and also hopefully where you can see there's some value in looking at host genetics in other diseases. What I've shown you so far today is that certain genes associate with not becoming infected and becoming infected with HIV. There are CCR5 mutations that can prevent HIV infection. And I spent a lot of time trying to discuss with you other mutations or other host genes that can associate with disease progression, whether people develop AIDS more slowly or develop more rapidly. And these uh, host genes can be found as CCR5 mutations, MHC or HLA alleles, and different cure alleles. And so with that, I'd just like to thank you for listening to this today. I hope you guys have learned something and thank uh, Dave and Esper who've helped me out quite a bit my lab and Dave's labs for uh, providing you with support. Mary Carrington, who provided some of these slides, especially on CCR5. My collaborator, Joanne Flynn, at the University of Pittsburgh, who's helping us with some TB research, and special thanks to my funding sponsors. And thanks to you guys. Thank you.